Good evening, brothers and friends from all over the country and all over the world for joining us this evening. It is the indeed pleasure and the honor of the Rubicon Masonic Society to bring us together again this evening for what is part four of our eight part virtual Masonic education series entitled Discovering Freemason. Each of these meetings are going to be recorded and repurposed for future Masonic education. As stated in the past, this setting is aimed to be very instructive with a progressive focus of a man's journey through Freemasonry from beginning to end. The Rubicon Masonic Society is an invitation only private group of Master Mason Freemasons located in Lexington, Kentucky. The purpose of Rubicon Masonic Society is to establish a deeper understanding and connection with Freemasonry, its traditions and practices, and further cementing the brotherhood of its members and guests through conviviality and unity outside of the lodge. My name is Brian Evans. I am the chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, and I want to thank you for your attendance and participation this evening. Throughout this series, you will meet many members within Rubicon, as well as various special guest appearances from Masons who will be sharing their personal experiences and knowledge about specific topics within our fraternity. My co-hosts this series are Worcester Brother Dr. John W. Bizak, past master and vice chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, and Worcester Brother Dan Kimball, past master and honorary member of the Rubicon Masonic Society. Again, I want to thank you very much for joining this evening. Let us begin. Worshipful Brother Lyle Van Outer, Chaplain of Rubicon Masonic Society, will you please deliver the opening charge this evening? I'm sorry, the opening devotion this evening. Uh, it's my honor, Worshipful Master. Brothers, let us pray. Great architect of the universe, be present in the hearts and minds of all those present. Grant that what transpires during this education series be a light to the faithful among all faiths that honor God through service and devotion to the unity of all mankind and all existences. Invest all those who speak and ask questions with a pure understanding of your divine wisdom and the ability to communicate and realize the principles of our order. May we succeed by the honor of your holy name. Amen. So mote it be. Thank you very much, worshipful brother. Brothers and friends, the agenda this evening is as follows. In a moment, I will outline the purpose, protocol, and recommendations for these meetings. We will then proceed directly into part four of our eight-part series. Following the presentation, we will open up the meeting for all attendees for discussion and live question and answer. Following the discussion period, we will provide details on future education as well as final comments in preparation to close. Worshipful Brother Kimball, will you please deliver the disclaimer to our attendees? Thank you, Brother Brian. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation about Freemasonry that currently exists in both virtual and non-virtual forms. Only factual information capable of being independently verified and consistent with the accepted academic research standards will be presented in this series. While the information presented during this series will be factual, any opinions expressed during the various presentations will be those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. All material contained in this presentation is suitable for Masons and non-Masons. No private information, including, but not limited to, passwords, signs, grips, or other elements of Masonic ceremonies will be disclosed during any part of this virtual series. By participating in this virtual meeting, you consent to the use of your name, likeness, and voice by the Rubicon Masonic Society. This entire presentation is the property of the Rubicon Masonic Society and may not be used without the written permission of the Rubicon Masonic Society. Worshipful Brother Bizak, will you please read the purpose for our series? Certainly, Brother. The purpose of this educational series tonight, friends, is to deliver a factual and foundational overview of our honorable fraternity, beginning with a man's initial contact with the fraternity, his progression through the Masonic degrees, and the life path of a man as a Freemason in his daily pursuit of self-improvement by applying those lessons and the tools of the craft. Thank you, Worship Brother. Brothers, the protocol for these meetings are as follows. 
As you know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are welcome to attend and participate. Therefore, please everyone be mindful that anything we discuss this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees, as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. No alcohol, no smoking, no food or foul language will be permitted. There is no discussion of politics or religion at any time and attendees may be removed if not following protocol. In an effort to best assure that this virtual meeting is an enjoyable experience for all attendees, we respectfully recommend and request the following. Recommended attire for our meetings is coat and tie. Please type your name and the lodge you're from under your picture or video to identify yourself to others. If you're not a part of a lodge, then simply type guest next to your name. Please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Please enable your video camera so other attendees can see you. Please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking and please turn off all other computer programs to eliminate outside distractions. Brothers and friends, the title of our eight part Masonic education series is Discovering Freemasonry. The brothers within the Rubicon Masonic Society have worked extremely diligently in order to provide you, with the out, you and the outside world with a factual overview and introduction to the philosophies and the principles of Freemasonry. I want to reiterate again that this is not a program to detract in any way from the initiatory experience, nor to reveal passwords, grips, steps, or any other part or parts of Masonic ritual that is considered sacred or private in our fraternity. Upon our studies and surveys in and outside of Rubicon, we have consistently learned that new and even veteran Masons were never provided an explanation of the fundamentals that can be delivered in a basic overview such as this, hence the birth of this series. The Masonic topics that we have and will be covering in this series are as follows. Okay. What is Freemasonry? The path to becoming a Freemason and the entered apprentice degree have already been discussed. Tonight we'll be presenting on the Fellowcraft degree, followed by the Master Mason degree, next meeting, the legend of Hiram Abiff, living as a Freemason, and the commitments of a Freemason. Please understand that in the period of time that we have allotted for these episodes, it will be absolutely impossible to conduct anything other than an overview and discussion of each topic. We encourage you to remember and not to assume that all men are enrolled in this series are at the same level of Masonic instruction, and some may not be, again, Masons at all. While some participants will undoubtedly desire more in-depth discussion, others will be encountering some or all of this information for the first time. Those who desire more information to what is presented with this, within this series may be directed to specific books, papers, and websites that will assist the pursuit of quality, academic, and Masonic knowledge. Friends, tonight we'll be discussing the Fellowcraft degree. We have broken this overview down into four sections tonight. First, Worshipful Brother Brad Drew, member of the Rubicon Masonic Society, will start and provide an introduction and overview of the Fellowcraft degree. Second, Brother Jerry Johnston, member of Lexington Lodge Number One and Rubicon Masonic Society, will deliver the importance of the liberal arts and sciences of this degree. Third, Worshipful, <clears throat> excuse me, Worshipful Brother Alan Martin, member of the Rubicon Masonic Society, will outline the expectations of the fellow craft Mason. And finally, our special guest presenter, Jerry L. Smith, will conclude the presentation with his highlights on the fellow craft degree from his perspective. Worshipful brother S. Brad Drew, past master and member of the Rubicon Masonic Society and my good friend, the floor, sir, is yours to begin tonight. Worship Brother Drew, you are muted. All right, can you hear me now? We've got you. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, good evening, brothers and friends. So, um, as Worship Brother Brian stated, my name is Brad Drew, and I'll be the opening presenter this evening as we jump in and discuss the fellow craft degree of Freemasonry. <clears throat> Honestly, when I was given this opportunity and we started this Rubicon project, I was absolutely thrilled that I was chosen for this degree. Um, as it is my personal favorite degree. And I'll explain a little bit why later as we move forward. Also, just as a disclaimer on my end, uh, please be aware that my presentation style often bounces around. So if you're curious about something or you want to hear more about something, 
um, that I touch on. I welcome those questions later on in the evening when we have that opportunity. So to begin, I really want to discuss how and why this degree, its ritual and ceremonies are considered solemn, and to an extent why there's certainly no place for any levity or horseplay uh, or making a man feel uncomfortable in this or any other Masonic degree. So a phrase that most of us have most certainly heard is that Freemasonry is a peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Whether you're a Freemason or not, if you Google Freemasonry, that's probably going to be in your top 10 searches. But what does that really mean? What is a peculiar system of morality? What does veiled in allegory even mean? When we think about it, the word peculiar really is not used in the sense of being an odd or strange word but more as a pure or original connotation of the individual person, the individual brother. In fact, a system of morality is simply where each brother needs to understand and practice for himself. So true morality is the science of conduct, and that application takes great technique, skill, and often a significant amount of time. But why? Why this veiled and allegory um, you know, piece? Well, simply put, in the days of the ancient mysteries, Profound truths were often veiled from the eyes of the profane by means of an allegory or myth. We've all heard them. So this one phrase really identifies not only what the fellow craft degree is, but what ritual in all of Freemasonry is meant to be, veiled from the eyes and ears of the profane. Now, when I think about the importance personally of the ritual and ceremonies of the fellow craft degree, a few things often come to mind. I think about the oath Freemasons take to provide mutual support between brothers, I think about the promise to support and protect our brothers, uh, protect our friends, our families, and sometimes even those we don't necessarily know. The ritual is meant to teach spiritual lessons with great dignity, meaning that horseplay or hazing not only desecrates the honorable and ancient purposes of Freemasonry, but also creates a poor image of the fraternity in the eyes of really everyone. The lodge is also a place where brothers can be treated with dignity and decorum at all times. And when we think about the Fellowcraft degree, the use of the words dignity and support are often emphasized when thinking about the worth of the individual brother. Now, when you think about terms like dignity, respect, decorum, support, what comes to mind for you? Now, when we think about the fellow craft degree, when we think about the fellow, what fellow, craft, fellow of the craft actually means, and I'm sorry, Brother Brian, if you could advance the slide, there we go. Uh, when we think about what fellow of the craft actually means, we think about this being the end of a, mem a member's apprenticeship. So at the end of a member's apprenticeship, he would be examined in lodge, and if found to be worthy and could prove a proficiency, he was then released from being an apprentice and made a full member or fellow of the craft. To jump directly into the fellow craft degree and a little bit of its history, we really need to first understand and realize that while today the fellow craft degree is the second degree of Freemasonry, it certainly has not always been that way. At one point in time, the final degree of Freemasonry was that of the fellow craft. There was not a third degree or master mason degree. The term fellow of the craft was originally referred to as the highest or senior phrase in craft masonry. Now, in the operative lodges of the Middle Ages, there was only one degree, one ceremony which allowed admission or membership into the lodge. And then during the 1500s, we see the degree for the entered apprentice developed. And then we see, you know, we also see records of, of degrees of this degree, the entered apprentice degree um, in the minutes of Edinburgh Lodge as early as 1598, for example. And then we see the second or fellow craft degree being developed, which truly signified a fully qualified Mason, um, someone who was ultimately fit to be elected as master. When the first Grand Lodge was founded in 17, 1717, um, there were only two degrees and we see that specifically in the first book of Constitution. In the 1723 edition of Anderson's Constitution, he specifically states in Regulation 9 that no brother can be a warden until he has passed the part of fellow craft. And then again, when stating that a Mason cannot be a Grand Master unless he has been a fellow of the craft before his election. So we see this phraseology of fellow craft or fellow of the craft used throughout Anderson's Constitution again and again, um, and more specifically in Regulation 13. However, in the 1738 edition of the Constitution, so 15 years later, that original Regulation 13 was changed to state apprentices must be admitted fellow craft and master, which really to me suggests that the three degrees of Freemasonry has certainly been created some time between 1723 and 1738. And, and I say that thinking about Daniel Pritchard's Masonry Dissected of 1730, the seven years after the first uh, Constitutions came out. 
and, and masonry dissected the three degrees of the ritual had, had clearly been mentioned various times. So the thought here is that the original Regulation 13 of 1723 had to be altered or stated in some sort of clear form uh, when 1738 came out to really, at that point, um, state that three degrees of Freemasonry had been created. Therefore, fellow craft degree was now the second degree of Freemasonry. Um, the fellow craft degree is often represented as the adulthood stage of a man's life. So in one sense, the fellow craft degree symbolizes the stage of responsibility during a man's life on earth. In this stage, his task is really to acquire knowledge and apply it to the building of his own character and improving the society in which he lives. William Preston says that Freemasonry is a means to educate men in the liberal arts and sciences. The fellow craft mason is urged to advance his education in these fields during the ritual of this degree. And some view the initiation of Freemasonry as representing a progressive teaching directed towards perfecting human nature, where, uh, where each degree uh, addresses and instructs one part. So the body, the mind, the soul. Uh, we have the entered apprentice degree encompassing the body. The fellow craft degree addresses the mind. The master mason degree confers the central mystery of all Freemasonry. Uh, that is how the soul may be brought to its perfection, if you think about it in that sense. Um, now, everybody loves symbolism, and as Voice Brother Brian said it earlier, there's a lot to talk about in the degrees, and we're going to kind of scratch over a little bit tonight. But, um, you know, in the fellow craft degree, there's plenty of symbolism that takes place. And this really speaks to, when you look at that symbolism, it really speaks to taking the next step in life. This degree symbolizes the methods of developing and progressing in the craft, and really the emergence into spiritual manhood. Uh, therefore, we find symbols of advancement, passage, instruction, and elevation throughout the entire fellow craft degree. We find symbolism of taking the next step in a new way of approaching the East, for example. Uh, what was often considered in the last degree or the entered apprentice degree to be our weaker nature has now been squared and elevated. Our working tools are now testing instruments, and with them we, we try, we square, we prove, and we really learn to develop the faculty of our own judgment. So what is valuable? What is real? What is true? And ultimately, gaining entrance to a new place perfectly symbolizes a distinct advancement into our work as Freemasons and men. The fellow craft degree is often referred to as the operative degree. But why? I had to think about this for a while. I had to do a good amount of research and consult with my peers on this, uh, this section of the project. What makes it operative? Well, when we think about the meaning of operative, we need to really understand that Freemasons were and we're often skilled workmen who engaged in some sort of building trade, some architecture, um, some skilled craft of their own. As a fellow craft mason, this means that you have passed through the ceremonies, assumed obligations, and you're now registered on the books of your lodge to sit with either entered apprentices or fellow craft. Now, whether you are a Freemason or not, or whether you've gone through the fellow craft degree or not, you probably recognize from your own research and a little bit of what we've already talked about tonight, that this degree is specifically a call for learning and an urge to study. A fellow craft degree often means taking on and doing additional tasks that require knowledge and education. And as we spoke about in the previous slide, let's take the seven liberal arts and sciences, for example, very briefly. A fellow craft mason is charged to learn, study, and practice each of these arts and sciences. Not anything to hide. We see that this degree frankly speaks to the fact that knowledge is required, which means that your time spent as a fellow craft mason is important as long as you're using those tools and practicing those arts and sciences that we've been taught. By practicing what has been learned and taught, we see brothers start to build character. They begin to improve themselves and improve those around them. As a speculative Freemason, we see, we see that emphasis is laid on the significance of the term fellow. In its most basic meaning, this word signifies bond and mutual trust. Just think about it at, at its simplest point. It also has a deeper meaning, though, the idea of a follower, a companion, or an associate. So, though often they have less skill or less ability than that of a master mason, for example, a fellow craft is certainly not a servant nor a subject, but an associate, a companion, and more so, a brother. To, to wrap up the first section of the program tonight, I'm going to close with a thought um, that the fellow craft degree demonstrates that Freemasonry is a progressive science. So one of my favorite parts about the degree. Now, how is this true? What makes it progressive? So the work of this degree is, like that of the entered apprentice degree, preparatory for advancement into the higher degree of a master mason. 
but it differs essentially in the importance of the symbolism. Now, the symbolism of the Fellowcraft degree is plentiful, which is why, and I think I said it earlier, which is why it's my favorite degree. Um, you can read and learn about symbolism of the Fellowcraft degree for years. Um, now, we'll hear a little bit more about symbolism in our next section with Brother Jerry. However, to point out two of my favorite symbols are meaning, because I have the four. Uh, in the Fellowcraft degree, a brother learns of a flight of winding stairs. So three, five, and seven steps that generate to further instruction. Now, could this be further light in Freemasonry, progressiveness in Freemasonry? For the fellow craft, the brother is, often, uh, is also given the wages, which are the cord of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy, which symbolize peace, harmony, and strength. Three wages to help a man and a brother grow spiritually both in and out of Freemasonry. The ritual and its ceremonies of the fellow craft degree show that Freemasonry is a progressive science by the continuous preparation and repetition of the ritual work. The moving of our focus from what is needed to be strengthened to what is already strong, and as previously discussed, fellow craft masons are workmen, as they are now found to be found to be proficient in their work. Now, this is so much different than that of an entered apprentice mason, which we've talked about before. In that degree, the person has to be vouched for in, so, in order to be advanced. In the fellow craft mason, no one else can vouch for your advancement, only his proficiency can justify that advance, but ultimately showing his own progression. Step by step and brick by brick, the path of the fellow craft mason is certainly a progressive one. Thank you, brothers and friends. That is my time. I'll pass the torch to Brother Jerry. Thank you, Worship Brother Drew. Excellent, excellent start. Um, Brother Johnston, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother. Well, good evening, brothers and friends. My name is Jerry Johnston, and in this section, I'll be discussing the liberal arts and sciences, along with the rewards of a fellow craft mason, and how strength and establishment can be found in the life of a fellow craft mason. And as part of his journey through Freemasonry, the fellow craft mason is encouraged to study the liberal arts and sciences. So we're going to discuss what those seven liberal arts and sciences are, why they were important in the past, and why they remain important today. So what are the seven liberal arts and sciences? They consist of two components, the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium is the three arts of language pertaining to the mind. These are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. In classical Latin, the word trivium meant a place where three roads meet, and the quadrivium a place where four roads meet. Let's talk about the trivium. The three components are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar is the art of speaking or inventing and combining symbols. A grammar is concerned with the thing as it, as it is symbolized. Logic is the art of thinking. A logic is concerned with the thing as it is known. And rhetoric is the art of communication, combining speaking and thinking. And rhetoric is concerned with the thing as it is communicated. Now, Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry describes the trivium this way. The first is grammar, which rejects from, all, from language all solecisms and barbarous expressions. The second is logic, which is occupied with the truthfulness of language. And the third is rhetoric, which seeks only the adornment of language. Let's talk about the quadrivium. The quadrivium is the four arts of quantity pertaining to matter. And these are arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Arithmetic is the study of the number of quantity outside of space and time. Geometry is a number in space or a magnitude at rest. Music is a number in time. Now you have the theory of numbers being applied, a study of relations between quantities, if you think about notes on a musical scale. And astronomy is a number in space and time, the study of a magnitude that is moving. So to put it in simple terms, arithmetic is a study of numbers. Geometry is a study of numbers in space. Music is a study of numbers in time. And astronomy combines everything with numbers in space and time. So why were the liberal arts and sciences important in the past? Well, the word liberal in the phrase liberal arts and sciences stems from the Latin word liberalis meaning appropriate for free men. It was essential for free citizens of Greece and Rome to have studied the liberal arts. Uh, liberal arts education uses Socratic method, named after the Greek scholar Socrates, which uses a question and dialogue format. 
This challenges students to support their arguments and encourages critical thinking. So why are they still important today? <clears throat> well, institutions of higher education still teach liberal arts and sciences today as a curriculum to create a well-rounded student through a broader range of study. In addition, critical thinking remains as important today as ever. So why are the liberal arts and sciences important in Freemasonry? In Freemasonry, the liberal arts and sciences are important as the word Freemason can be broken down into free, um, as in free thinker, uh, plus Mason, as in builder, would, uh, combined would equal Freemason, where we use our logic and reason to build a temple. So if you think of the pyramid and, and how one supports the other, uh, grammar would be the foundation for speaking, for asking questions. It allows one to challenge the information received rather than act or react blindly to it. Logic processes and analyzes the information, identifies false arguments and contradictions. Uh, the outcome of using logic is having knowledge that can be trusted. Rhetoric is the written or verbal art of communication, where rather than asking questions, the speaker is trying to inform or persuade an audience. Rhetoric uses the information received by grammar and processed by logic to create a persuasive argument based on that logic. So what are the rewards of a fellow craft mason? Well, the rewards of a fellow craft mason are to be learned and earned step by step as he approaches the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. He learns to square his actions, to monitor and regulate them. Yeah, the fellow craft learns that he is equal among all Masonic brethren, regardless of opinions, occupations, or reliefs. He learns to if, live uprightly to a higher standard. The rewards of a fellow craft mason are the physical and spiritual nourishment, refreshment, and joy that he would receive for a living an industrious life devoted to the service of God and his fellow man. A fellow craft mason's wages or his reward are more than enough to supply all of his physical, moral, and spiritual needs. He will have health of body, mind, and soul. He will enjoy peace in this life, in the hour of death, and the life to come. Freemasonry makes its members wiser, better, and consequently happier. So how are strength and establishment found in the life of fellow craft mason? Sorry. The pillars of a fellow craft suggest the power which upholds the universe, the power of a divine creator or a great architect of the universe. This is a pillar with a celestial sphere. Also, the pillars represent study and labor. The man must work and complete manual tasks to provide for himself, his family, and his community. This is the pillar with a terrestrial sphere. And brothers, this concludes this section. I'm now going to hand it off to worshipful brother, Alan Morton. Thank you very much, brother Johnson. Excellent presentation. Worshipful brother Martin from the Rubicon Masonic Society as well. It's your turn. Thank you, worshipful uh, brother Evans. Good evening, brothers and friends. In this segment, I want to touch on the following three things. Uh, what lessons for the fellow craft appear in the study of nature? what is meant by square conduct, level steps, and upright intentions, and what is expected of a fellow craft mason. As previously mentioned, my brother Jerry, geometry is one of the seven liberal arts. Uh, the importance of geometry cannot be overemphasized for it is by geometry that we may curiously trace nature through her various windings to her most concealed recesses. Through geometry, we may discover balance and view with the light the perfect proportions which connect the vastness of the universe and all things in nature. Balance can be observed throughout nature. The changing of the seasons, equal parts of the day and night, duality of species, and ebb and flow of tides are but a few examples. Balance is the natural state of equilibrium and the natural state of Freemasonry. As we have previously identified, the central motif of the fellow craft degree is advancement and acquisition of knowledge. It is through the advancement and acquisition of this knowledge that allows the fellow craft to pursue, as in nature, perfect proportions of balance in their lives. 
As fellow craft masons, it's incumbent upon us to continually study the special knowledge introduced in the fellow craft ritual and to seek that knowledge and apply it to our lives. In doing so, we'll be better able to occupy our place in society with satisfaction and honor. In this degree, we are given the working tools necessary to aid in our endeavor to achieve just and upright behavior. When applying these tools as a rule and a guide for our action and conduct, we can readily identify the meaning of square conduct, level steps, and upright intentions. The square symbolizes morality, truthfulness, and honesty. The square forming an angle of 90 degrees is called a right angle and also symbolizes accuracy as it does not vary by a single degree. All stable and upright walls are built by use of a square. So the square is given to us to aid in the erecting of stable and upright walls in our internal temple. In applying the concept of the square in our daily interactions with others, we can reconcile our conduct by keeping them true and accurate. The level is a symbol of equality. As Masons, we think of equality in terms of an individual's internal qualifications rather than their external qualifications, such as wealth, social distinction, civil office, or even their service to mankind. If we think about a person's internal qualifications, we think about those characteristics and attributes associated with temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. And as you recall, those are the four cardinal virtues that were introduced in the entered apprentice degree. We also consider honesty, tolerance, kindness, respect, fidelity, all of these are but a few of the internal virtuous attributes associated with a person's internal qualifications. And I'm confident and sure that you could probably think of others that we could add to that list. Level steps in life require us to treat each person with worth and dignity, regardless of their external qualifications. Dan Sickles wrote in the General Ahiman Reason, the level is an emblem of equality. And it reminds us that in the sight of God, all men are equal. That he causes the sun to shine on the poor man's cottage as well as on the king's palace. When considering upright intentions, we have to look no further than the plum, as it is a symbol of uprightness of conduct. The plum line in Freemasonry is associated with the plum line the Lord promised Amos symbolizing God's standard of divine righteousness. The plum admonishes us to walk upright before God and men, squaring our actions by the square of virtue. So the square teaches morality, the level equality, and the plum justice and upright, uprightness of life and actions. Our working tools now become testing instruments, and with them we try to square and prove our conduct and actions. So by square conduct, level steps, and upright intentions, we hope to ultimately to ascend to those blessed mansions where all goodness emanates. With them, we learn to develop the faculty of judgment. Through their uses, we discern what is valuable, what is true, and what is real. The expectations and responsibilities of a fellow craft mason are in part found in the obligation. It is, however, expected that the fellow craft mason acquire the special knowledge introduced in this degree and strive to apply that knowledge to their duties in life so that they are better able to occupy their place in society, satisfaction, and honor. It is expected of the fellow craft mason to conform to the principles of the order by steadily preserving in the practice of every commendable virtue. Such is the nature of the engagements as a fellow craft mason, and to these the fellow craft is bound by the most sacred ties. As one can readily identify, the process of learning is never ending. Continued study of, of the principles instilled in the fellow craft degree is essential to increase the depth of our understanding and broaden our perspective not only of the world in which we live, but also of ourselves. Practicing the lessons of 
This degree certainly leads to personal growth and development and further delivers on the promise of free masonry. And finally, brothers and friends, the principles instilled in the fellow craft degree helps us to be intentional, intentional about how we go about improving ourselves and reaching milestones in personal growth and development, intentional about how we occupy our place in society, intentional about how we treat others, and intentional about our upright intentions. Which for Brother Evans, this concludes section three of the fellow craft degree. Thank you very much, Worship Brother Martin. Excellent presentation. And now we will move to our special guest this evening, uh, which in fact, all of our guests are special, but this one is very special. He always has something very wise to say. And before we give him the floor, Worship Brother Bizak, would you please do the honors and provide uh, an introduction to our special guest, Jerry Smith. In, in my pleasure, brother. Our cameo guest tonight, brothers, is Worship Brother Jerry Smith. Is a member of South Pasadena 290, Culver City, Poche number 467, where he's chair of the Esoterica Studies Committee. He's also a past master of the Southern California Lodge of Research and a Lincoln Scholar. Gerald serves on the board of the Southern California Lodge of Research's periodical publication, The Fraternal Review. If you haven't seen it or had one passed along to you, I heartily suggest that you uh, chat with Gerald and find out how you can get a subscription to that. <clears throat> Brother Smith is certainly well qualified to explain the essentials of many facets of Freemasonry. And in addition, for those who are genuinely in the pursuit of excellence in all aspects of our craft, he's equally qualified to discuss and speak on the topic of the restoration of the best practices of this fraternity. Having participated in in several of our past virtual meetings since May of this year, or March of this year, actually. We certainly welcome his involvement tonight and ask you to join in that welcome. Brother Jerriel. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Worshipful John. Um, and thank you to the, uh, the uh, Rub Rubicon Society for this uh, series, uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful um, uh, addition to our education. At its core, Freemasonry is an initiatory fraternity whose rituals are intended to transform men by connecting their human consciousness of the initiate with the consciousness of the creator that our fraternity calls the grand architect of the universe. The Masonic craft degrees, as you've been hearing, are a sequence of three initiation ceremonies. Initiation means the beginning or the start of something. And it must be kept in mind that our degree ceremonies are just that and only that. They are the start of a progress, a process that can only achieve its transformational purpose by further study of the symbolism and daily practice of the principles that they stand for. I'd like to describe five steps of a process beginning in, in initiation, going through education, contemplation, application, and transformation. Initiation, which acts on the physical and emotional levels, is the experiencing of the ritual degree ceremony. And for a Freemason, it is not limited to his own ceremony. Every ceremony that he attends, he should be re-experiencing his own initiation. It's through the repetition of the ritual that the lessons sink into our consciousness. But that step has to be followed by education, which works on the mental level. It includes things like study, classes, lectures, and discussions of the symbols and their meanings, things like what we are doing right now. In this regard, I'd like to quote from a book that was just published by Brother Jamie Paul Lamb called Approaching the Middle Chamber, a reference to the second degree. And I quote him, 
It is important to note that there are no extraneous symbols used in the craft. Every symbol employed in Masonic ritual should be seen as a prompt or perhaps a clue which the individual mason, mason would do well to investigate beyond its superficial meaning. Each of the symbols, the exotic, the exoteric interpretations of which are given during the lectures, represent a wealth of wisdom and understanding awaiting those who are prepared to penetrate their mysteries by the application of occult exegetical and interpretive methods. Salient upon, among such interpretive methods is contemplation, our next step. That is an inclusive term that for Masons reflects, includes reflection, prayer, and meditation. These are states of consciousness that take us beyond the limits of language and logic and into the intuitive functions of our higher mental and spiritual senses. Thus, contemplation works on those levels of the higher mental and spiritual. It is essential for a deepening understanding of the symbolism of masonry and its meanings. Several times in the rituals, we're urged to contemplate or reflect upon, other words for meditate, one or another of the symbols or moral lessons presented to us during our degrees. In the fellow craft degree, for example, the candidate is instructed by his guide to contemplate the meanings of the terrestrial and celestial globes atop the pillars that guard the west gate from the preparation room into the sacred space of the lodge room. The fellow craft degree in particular is directed to our mental development as was explored by Brother Brad and uh, Brother Jerry, um, we study, we're urged to study things like the orders of architecture, the human senses, and most especially the seven liberal arts and sciences, among which, as Jerry pointed out, geometry is given a primary significance. Its importance is reflected in the letter G that is centered between the square and compasses on our most recognized symbol of our fraternity. We're told that it stands for geometry and for God. The God part is kind of unique to American and British Freemasonry as God is only spelled starting with a G in English and in German. But in Masonry, geometry itself is in a way a reference to God, which is why it is frequently called sacred geometry. And our ritual suggests that it is by studying nature, as was discussed by Brother Allen, uh, we may come to know and understand God and how his creation works. The sacred geometry is a reference to nature. That is a ter um, and that nature is a term for God's creation, and its study is therefore a means of understanding the principles by which all phenomena are structured and function. In that sense, it might be said that we ourselves are nature. This thing brings us full circle back to the esoteric directive to all seekers of greatest, greater light in all traditions, to learn to know thyself as that is essential to becoming a better person. Of course, knowledge is of little use unless it is put to fruitful activity, which brings us to the next step, application. Application works in the interpersonal field. It's changing our thoughts, our words, and our deeds to conform to the moral principles that are inculcated in our initiation ceremonies and the symbolism by which those moral principles are represented. We have to, as has been mentioned before, be practicing masonry every day. This leads us to the fifth uh, step of this process that I've been describing, transformation. For Masons, 
fulfillment of our potential to become better men. Excuse me a minute. I lost my picture. Um, let me go back. Uh, fulfillment of our potential to become the better man that is protect the purpose and promise of true initiation is the lifelong task of a Freemason. This is symbolized by the rough and perfect bachelors that we meet in the entered apprentice degree. It teaches us that Masons strive every day to be better than they were the day before. And that is important to distinguish that we never strive to be better than other Masons. We, dis we, we aspire to be better than ourselves. And with that, I will wrap up. I want to um, share a couple of things though, along the lines of what I've been uh, speaking about. Um, one is uh, with regard to Masonic meditation. I'd like to mention that we have a real growing a movement in both the Scottish Rite and the Blue Lodge practices for bringing into play uh, meditation. Uh, there is a, the Recademy of Reflection that is at work at the Scottish Rite level. And that was uh, started by a wonderful brother called Chuck Dunning. And this is a copy of his book. If you could see it there on the screen, uh, it's called uh, Contemplative, Free Ma uh, Contemplative Masonry. I'd recommend it to anybody looking to learn about that. There's also a new group, relatively new group called the Masonic Legacy Society. Uh, Brother Brad is very uh, uh, active in that and was one of its creators that uh, is teaching how to teach meditation at the Blue Lodge level. And then in terms of studying the second degree, I'd like to re recommend, first of all, particularly for uh, the spiritual implications of the degree, this book, it's called The Ceremony of Passing. It's by, um, uh, W. L. Wilmshurst, who, if you uh, become a Mason and, and become a studier of Masonry, is somebody that you should uh, become familiar with. And the second one is the brand new book that I quoted from before, uh, Approaching the Middle Chamber by uh, Jamie Paul Lamb. Its, it's subtitle is The Seven Liberal Arts in Freemasonry and the Western Esoteric Tradition. And uh, with that, I'll end my remarks and let us get going with our discussion. Thank you, brothers. Great. Thank you, Worship Brother Gerald Smith. Appreciate it very much. Uh, excellent presentation indeed. So as everyone can see here, clearly the fellow craft degree is, uh, is a challenging degree. It's a degree that really makes you think, ask questions, uh, and, and forces you um, to use probably parts of your brain that we normally don't use. Um, it, hearing it back from your all's presentation um, for the first time is, uh, is eye-opening. It, it, it's a reminder of how complex Freemasonry really is and can be, but also how simple at the same time. Um, what I'd like to do is, is to encourage everyone, I, I'm surely everyone has some thoughts, questions uh, regarding this topic, and uh, I'd like to uh, encourage you to uh, at any time, you're welcome to unmute yourself when you feel there's the right opening to ask a question openly within everyone, uh, within the group. Uh, but also, if you would prefer to have me call on you, then you're welcome to submit a, a chat message and just mention you have something to say. So e either way is fine. We will make sure we get your questions and answered and hopefully have some lively discussion. Um, with that being said, I'd like to first go back to Worship Brother Brad Drew's uh, initial presentation where, Brad, you started off by saying that this degree is your favorite degree, and I was kind of hoping you could elaborate a little bit further on, on why that is the case and how that became your favorite degree, and I know that you have some history of, of doing some excellent ritual work as well, and I, 
I, I believe uh, you've done some excellent ritual work in this degree. Maybe you want to elaborate slightly. Uh, and then also, why is it your favorite degree? And also explain a little bit further of the progression of this degree into what is adulthood of this of the degree, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to explain the best I can. So um, I guess I'll start with saying, you know, the, the Fellowcraft degree is my favorite degree. And why I put it that way, um, you know, and obviously in my own opinion here, is really the degree when you get to you for me as a Freemason where I started to really be able to learn about myself and challenge myself. So part of the reason that I enjoy Freemasonry so much and my brothers at Lexington and the Rubicon know this, but I love to have discussions and especially challenging discussions sometimes where I can learn from others and I can help teach others, um, whether every every conversation is a valuable one. And um so for me, the Fellowcraft degree really opened up that door. The Entered Apprentice degree was great. It introduced me to Freemasonry, uh, but I think it was so new and it was so overwhelming at first that it took a long time to actually learn that, and it was kind of just getting my feet wet into Freemasonry. And by the time I, was, you know, I went into my Fellowcraft degree, became a Fellowcraft Mason, uh, I was really able to kind of sit back and learn about the progressiveness, which I kind of spoke about in my piece earlier tonight about, uh, you know, the Fellowcraft degree is, is progressive degree and it teaches you progressing you know from one to the other um, and there's so much symbolism and hidden meanings and uh, you know things that you can learn about yourself just by going through this degree and, and, and really learning about you know the the working tools and the wages and some of the lectures and you know and, and all of this you can research in google you don't have to be a free base to learn about but for me you know to kind of sum it up this degree is my favorite because it really challenged me the most um you know each each of the degrees did rightfully so, but the fellow craft um, and going through this degree and, and thank you, Brian, for your words, but I, I am, you know, I, I do love ritual. It's a big piece of why I love Freemasonry as well. And getting to study and mentor and coach the fellow craft degree and relearn and reteach um, and reread a lot of the ritual and the meanings and, and the true understanding of the degree um, has allowed me just to be able to have deeper conversation and deeper understanding. Um, on topics that are just not, you know, not just exclusive to the fellow craft degree, but um, this degree really kind of opened that door for me. So personal fa reason why it's my favorite degree, um, you know, the progression into adulthood, there's so many different thoughts and views on this. Um, you know, typically you think about the apprentice degree being a child or an infant, your fellow craft degree, you pass into, you know, um, adulthood at whatever stage or age of life and then you know the master mason now you're a seasoned you know um man and you're going into retirement into the kind of the end of your end of your days and enjoying what all of you you know created and been a part of during your life so um you know the, the progression in adulthood really kind of goes back to the um, the piece i spoke about of uh, a continuous learning and continuous education um you know practicing what we preach and practicing what you've been taught um, as an infant, you know, everything is new to you. You're, you know, you're kind of, you're learning everything for the first time. You're, you're learning, you know, I, I'm going to touch the stove once and burn my hand. I'm, I'm going to do it again because I'm still a baby and I'm trying to learn that where as an adult, you know, you understand that if I touch that, it's going to be hot. I'm going to burn my hand. Um, but why is it hot? What did I do to make it hot? What is, you know, what is the reason for that? And then, you know, as you're a, a master mason and you've spent your days understanding why people burn their hands, you're like, I'm not going to burn my hand because I've been there and done that. So um, kind of the simple, basic reason, which I'd encourage more discussion on that because, again, I love learning about, you know, other people's input and opinions and thoughts on things. But um, really that, that passing to the adulthood stage or that middle part of a man's life or a person's life, um, you know, the fellow craft degree does that by just teaching and, and you learn additional education, um, additional study and practice. Excellent. Thank you, Worship Brother, very much. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. you know, it, it's it's fascinating. There, there's, we, we, what we don't want to do is, is, is spoil anything that um, uh, any entered apprentices might be progressing to with the fellow craft degree, but, you know, the ritual itself is absolutely beautiful and for those of us that have performed it or those of you that have performed it or uh, obviously gone through it, um, I think you would probably agree. And I, I'm really curious to get uh, Worship Brother Van Outer, not to put you on the spot, but I, I've seen your 
um, staircase lecture. And I would encourage anyone that's, that's going to be Googling things to, to really kind of not go too far in this. Of course, it's all out there. So if you find yourself looking for information and run across any ritual, I would just be, be a man and turn it off or go to the next page. So that way you can enjoy the experience of the ritual. So with that in mind, uh, Worship Brother Van Outer, I've seen you give the Staircase Lecture. It's a beautiful lecture. And I'm just wondering if there's anything in particular that perhaps you might have learned from it um, as, as being the presenter of the lecture that maybe you didn't, maybe didn't resonate you, with you when you went through it. Um, or any comments regarding this degree that you'd like to offer? Um, I don't. I don't really have anything else to add. I, I think what has been stated has just been fantastic. Um, I would like to reiterate uh, what Brother Jeriel Smith has has emphasized, and that meditation is such a vital part of understanding. Um, understanding any of the work of the degree. When I, I got my undergraduate degree um, in music from Asbury College, emphasis on the word college at the time, it's no longer a college, it's a university. Uh, they prided themselves on being a liberal arts school and teaching you the rudiments anyway of all seven of them and when you graduate and finally get you know, your diploma and they kick your butt out the door, they brag on the fact that you are able to educate yourself properly um, without, with, with no more school. You can learn anything that you need to learn because you have been given the tools to do so. That's really the only thing I would add to it. Um, there's a really good book by a guy named Christopher Derrick, and I don't remember the exact name. He's not a Mason. I believe he's, he may even be Catholic, I'm not sure, but he wrote an excellent book on, uh, on the liberal arts education and its necessity to bring it back into uh, the general college curriculum instead of focusing on such particulars um, all the time. But uh, really, those, those are the only things I, I, would, I would add to anything that's been said already. I think this has been a really fantastic and enlightening uh, education. Thank you, Worship Brother. Um, Worship Brother Kimball, I'm going to call on you, and, and because I muted you earlier by accident, so you have to, I have to have you hear, hear you say something, and, and I know you have some wisdom on this degree as well, and, I, and Little Birdie told me that it might be one of your favorite degrees also, so um, would you mind just sharing some of your, your comments on the degree? Uh, just in looking at the chat box, it, it, it appears to be the favorite degree of, of several of our participants this evening. And I understand why, um, I think. Um, uh, and first of all, let me say that I, I think the Fellowcraft degree in our current structure suffers from being the middle child. Uh, we're excited about the interdependence degree because that, uh, that gets us into the lodge. And we're excited about the Master Mason degree because that's that's the end of the rainbow for us. And, and I think the lessons of the Fellowcraft degree are frequently overlooked. And that's a shame uh, because they, uh, uh, they are so important. Uh, I was a Mason for 20 years before I saw the Stair Lecture. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, I, I feel somewhat cheated by that because the, the Staircase Lecture is, is one of the most beautiful uh, ceremonies that I've ever seen. And it, to me, sort of defines what we're all about. Uh, you know, we're specifically charged uh, in, in the Fellowcraft degree to study the seven liberal arts and sciences. Uh, and, and I would um, uh, be very surprised if there's anybody who's participating in this meeting this evening who can, uh, who can identify a time in your lodge, in your craft lodge, where you've ever had a discussion about any of the liberal arts and sciences. Uh, we overlook them, and, uh, and we do that to our detriment. Uh, I do have a question, uh, Brother Brian, that I'd, I'd like to pose. Please. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, we talked about, uh, or, or our presenters talked about, the working tools of, uh, of fellow craft mason, and, uh, and particularly the level, and the concept that as masons we meet on the level, and we are equal uh, in lodge. And in the society in which we live, we hear a lot about equality of outcome. Uh, we hear about income equality, but yet 
the fact of the matter is men have been gifted with greatly different levels of skill and greatly different levels of ability. So how do we reconcile the concept of meeting on the level and being equal with the fact that we all have such varying degrees of abilities? That is a fascinating question. Um, I'll, I'll go first if, if you don't mind. And, and mine is probably gonna be more more basic and, and not as wise as, as many others would offer. But uh, I think it's important to, uh, if you wanna become a Freemason and to be a Freemason is to honestly and genuinely check your ego at the door. Um, it's not about it's not about wealth. It's not about money. It's not about uh, it's really not about those other arbitrary skills that are important in the real world, and that we compete against people with. To me, it's genuinely about honestly checking yourself at the door, and looking at everyone as as brothers, as family, as equals, and and treating them the way you'd want to be treated. Um, so that, to me, that's the simplest answer that I can think of off the top of my head. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. And, um, but I think it's something that we should all do, personally. Would anyone else like to pick, piggyback? I'd, I'd like to offer that one of the most valuable things is humility, especially for uh, people who advance in um, higher office and who are given uh, rewards. Uh, remember that we are never working for the reward. We're never working for our advancement. If we work for the good of the fraternity and the good of all, reward and advancement will come our way. Indeed. Bruce, go ahead. Thank you, Brent. Uh, one of the things that, as I was listening to, to Daryl, is I reflect upon my own lodge, and most of the time, especially with uh, one past master who has served a couple times now, because some of our young men we're not wanting to advance or their lives got in the way but he seems to think that it's a race to get out of the meeting and uh, not keep discussing business or even have an, an open discussion about lodge education and masonic education and so if we start at seven o'clock we are generally out by eight o'clock or shortly thereafter. And, you know, it's a real shame because when I was senior warden of my lodge and I sought out somebody to help me. And unfortunately, I had to look outside my own lodge to a good and friend and brother um, who was a had been a district deputy at one time and it was a uh, Scottish Rite brother, but he drummed it into me where I learned a lot more and I realized and I had to bite my tongue and my ego and uh, think about, because he would, when we finally got to that point, he was like, close your eyes, what are you doing? Who's, who are you addressing? Who are you doing? And I had to really stop and think, you know, as master that I was going to be, what is the movement? What is going on? And all that stuff. You know, it's not just repeating words. It's who's being addressed? Who's doing all this stuff? And I think we lose out on training our officers when we're not emphasizing all those things so thank you very much brother thank you bruce uh, i want to take a different perspective and i hope i'm not going to catch him too off guard if he's still on here uh brother tim smith um tim you, you're an asset to to uh lexington one rubicon etc and um 
and, and, and you f found yourself being a um, uh, not actually giving the lecture, but being a guide. I'm just trying to find the word. Being a guide within a lot of our degrees, and you do an excellent job. And I, and I think it's important maybe to even address that for a moment and, and say why that's important with not just any degree, but specific to the fellow craft degree. And because um, I think it's a big role that often gets overlooked. Would, would you have anything to comment about this degree or, or actually the participation in the role of the guide in the degree? Sure. Is my microphone working? Yes. Okay, good. You know, I, I think really it would go for all degrees because you have to remember that when you're a guide, that you're taking someone and it's something they're going to remember the rest of their life, something they're never going to forget. And, and you want to do that to the, the best you can and as perfect as you can get it. And I know that uh, it's always meant a lot to me when I have a guide for uh, our fellow craft, our EAs, our master masons, that I want to do my best. Absolutely. Um, has anyone else participated either as a guide or given the lecture that like to comment and, and just kind of share their experience? Chris, I see you have your hand up if you want to, if you want to chime in. Um, certainly. So, so I wanted to speak just a little bit to the question about how we can, can all kind of remain on the same level despite our varying differences and backgrounds and one of the things that that really kind of strikes me both in this degree and and um, kind of looking at the progression from the, the entered apprentice degree is is that that idea to um, it was mentioned just a little bit ago to to really stop take really examine ourselves take a deep look at what's driving our actions what's driving our desires how do we work with those and 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 how do we bring them into alignment uh, using the virtues and and how then can we best bring that out into the world and work with the forces of the world and 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 be the best people we can possibly be and 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 most represent the the qualities of 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 nature and the, the laws that up to uphold and support nature that we had just talked about and uh and and i think it's it's really um you know for each of us uh, an opportunity to to look at those areas to really examine where we're maybe not in best alignment with that and bring that forward and use this, the powers of the mind and use the, the opportunities that present themselves with, uh, within the world to, to continue that work. And, and regardless of what our backgrounds and education and, and careers might be, I think the more we're able to continue this process of growth and, and development and transformation by applying these works, the better off we all are in service, not to ourselves, but to to creating a better world for all. So I was just wanted to to share that as a response to to your question, uh, and and, uh, and and thank you for the time. Thank you, brother Chris. I always appreciate your comments. Uh, Worship brother Cameron, your hand is raised. Feel free to speak at any time. Uh, John Cameron. There we go. Thank you, Brother Evans. Um, am I, I am I unmuted? Am I? Okay, good. You're good. I apologize for this uh, for this beginning. I appreciate the opportunity to comment on this degree. Um, I've delivered the degree uh, a number of times uh, and have gotten myself so worked up that I would have uh, heart palpitations in, in delivering the degree. When delivered, uh, when delivered well, it's probably the most informative as well as the, the most uh, engaging uh, lecture, the middle chamber lecture specifically is what I'm thinking of, or the step, seven steps lecture. It contains all of the essential information that, that is required in our middle ages, which to me are the formative, really formative ages. As a, uh, as a younger man and a younger athlete, um, I, I was able, to, to have my ego stroked, and I developed a, a, a very uh, good ego. And um, I, I saw the world as, 
going around me. It wasn't really until I became a Mason and started to, uh, to, to progress through the transformational steps that the three degrees give me, and specifically in the middle chamber lecture, that I began to realize the, the concepts of humility, which was mentioned, and the concept of service. My, my, my role and my, my development is one of service to my brothers. Um, that to me is, a, is a, a key element. Now, I'm beginning to learn as well you know, through, the, through the fellow craft degree and the, and, the, and the master masons degree that I, I can't control what other people say, but I can control what I hear. And I was surprised uh, at my hearing problems early in my life. Um, so this, the middle chamber lecture and the, and the, uh, the fellow craft degree to me are the foundational uh, development pieces for growth within our brothers within the lodge. And our society today allows one's ego to grow to uh, enormous, uh, enormous uh, uh, sizes and the focus on, on the individual as being the best, uh, you know, I'm, I'm great, I'm lovable, I'm wonderful. Uh, those are detractors in, in terms of developing a civil society and, and having uh, civil uh, conversations. So Brother Evans, I'll stop there. This, this degree uh, is, as I mentioned, is one of the most important degrees in my Masonic development. So thank you, Brother. Thank you, Brother Cameron. Uh, Brother David Crickard from Lexington Lodge, number one. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worshipful Master, uh, Worshipful Brothers and Brothers. So, uh, uh, Brother Kimball, when he when he brought up his question, it made me uh, think about something that I had to look up in, in my sacred book of knowledge, and I just wanted to read it. So it goes... Uh, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Hmm. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined those members of the body and given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that the others should be not so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And one part, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So that's sort of not my answer, but something I remembered and was able to look up and share with, uh, and that's what I got out of, that's my answer to Brother Kimball's question, I guess. That's great. That's really uh, a great share. W would you mind posting that in our chat, the, um, where to find that scripture? Thank you, Brother. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, uh, Dr. Bizak, um, is there anything you'd like to add this evening? Uh, I would like to say something. In, um not in response to anything that's been said, but maybe in another area. I, th I think there's a value in, in all the degrees, of course, but particularly this degree, because it is the middle, as Brad pointed out. And delivering it, learning the ritual, conferring the ritual, uh, learning the one of the lesson lectures in this degree, especially the G letter lecture. I think these, when those of us in the room who have conferred this degree and have delivered the lecture maybe once or on multiple occasions, when you learn it, just as it does in any other degrees, but something about this one even more, it starts gelling. It starts making sense because you're perceiving it a little bit differently because you now learn to deliver it. And aside from the uh, theatrics you might want to throw into it or your style of delivery, those words in just the G lecture alone, taking nothing away from the staircase or any other part of the ritual, but in the G lecture, if you follow those 14 paragraphs, at least that's about what it is in Kentucky's ritual, 
it pretty much sums up the whole point of geometry. And as Gerald said, this connection to the rest of Freemasonry and the great architect of the universe. But if you don't study it in that capacity or learn it to confer it or deliver it, we have to admit that most men, when they hear it, it's a little profound. It may be a little bit above their usual vernacular, a whole lot above the vernacular. And often you remember you had it and you might remember one section of it or a word or two here. And that part that's always used to defend something else about the internal as opposed to the external. We miss the meaning of those things. And you might hear it in Lodge a couple of times given, and you might learn from that, but I would submit that there is nothing that teaches Freemasonry like learning it and delivering it. And I would challenge anybody who has done that to argue that it didn't make a difference to them after they started learning the ritual and delivering it. And as John said a few minutes ago, uh, what you say, John, you had heart palpations. You get so worked up with the uh, fellow craft degree. I mean, that's part of it, getting excited about it and living it with passion and really feeling that you get it. You really start to get it. And, you know, you, we probably never get it completely, but we're working toward that. So anyway, my, my, my comments have to do with just the intent of learning what we preach and what we are supposed to be passionate about by actually learning it, not just hearing it repeated over and over and over by other people. Uh, thank you, Worship Brother Biz. I couldn't agree more. It, it reminds me of a saying that the teacher learns more than the student. So if you're forced to, to be the educator, um, you're actually going to learn probably quite a bit more than the recipient. I saw a lot of people nodding their heads. And Worship Brother Martin, I saw you nodding your head. Would you like to add anything else to that? Well, uh, my comments are any addition to what Worshipful Brother John just said uh, would be that um, it, it's true that once you start delving into the uh, symbolism and the meaning of each of, of the three degrees, it it grows on you, and each one of them is carried forward. Uh, we don't leave them in the past. We don't leave the concepts and the lessons taught in the EA degree, in the EA degree. They carry forward right into the fellow craft degree, and the fellow craft obviously carries forward into the master mason degree, and essentially balances the EA and the master Mason degree. If you, if you think of it as being in balance and I, I talked about balance and, and nature and the concept of, of trying to find equilibrium in um, uh, our lives, not only in our, our uh, personal conduct and how we go about engaging our daily activities, uh, not only with other individuals, but developing our own personal character and knowing ourselves. Um, that you can get excited about it. And if you're not excited about it, then you probably need to stop and go back and, and, and revisit the lessons that, that are uh, instilled in each one of the degrees. Because uh, the more you look at it, uh, the more your perspective changes on those smaller details in each of the degrees. And they grow into larger concepts and thoughts that uh, promote a greater, uh, I guess, urge or desire to want to pursue more knowledge, which is, hence in, in Fellowcraft degree, uh, the uh, particular aim of, of the degree, the acquisition of, of knowledge and advancement in personal growth and development. So those would be my only uh, additions to what Worshipful Brother John said. Excellent additions. Thank you very much, Brother. Thank you. Uh, Worship Brother Rich Hansen, floor is yours, sir. Hey, Worshipful Brother Evans, I just wanted to add to that just a little bit. Um, when I think of the Fellowcraft degree, what I what I often see is 
the candidates led into the Temple of Solomon, which is the body. And what we have found from that is that we're encouraged to study the seven liberal arts. And, and with that, we're to use the five senses. We often forget that. When we implore the five senses to us in the, the field of the seven liberal arts, what we find and what I have found is that I find the creator in everything. There's never been a liberal art that I've studied that if I study deep enough and critically think that I can't find the creator. And that's what I, I think that's what God was trying to do in the divinely inspired things that we, we deal with here is, is it's almost like a cat and mouse game. It's like he challenges man to study and to better himself. But every time you do, it always points to him, which solidifies his existence and it solidifies our faith. And of course we know that foreshadows the next degree. Um, so I, the study to, to better man or to increase knowledge, absolutely. But I think it's even deeper is in study to find him in every part of knowledge. And that's why I love the fellow craft degree. He sees everywhere within it. I think it is one of the best, like everybody else I've heard here. It's just fantastic. But I'm along with brother Kimball. We often leave a lot of it out. It's overlooked. And I think that's one of the key components that we, we need to bring back. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Excellent comments. In fact, hearing you say that reminded me of the thoughts that I had when Worship Brother Kimball mentioned, uh, how do you meet on the level? And I think doing what you just said is uh, you came here with nothing. We're going to be leaving here with nothing. So everything is putting the great architect of the universe first. And that's how you meet on the level. Um, well said. Uh, Terry, uh, Worship Brother Terry um, from uh, uh, McCloyd, are you still on? Because you've had a couple comments and I wanted to give you the floor if you're interested. I don't believe so. Okay. So brothers, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yep. Thanks, John. Um, worship brother, right worship brother, Tom Jackson, don't think I'm going to let you off the hook. Um, what would you like to add here this evening, sir? And if you could unmute yourself, there you go. Again, I'd just like to say it's a privilege to be able to sit and listen to the uh, programs that you've created. Uh, when I was in undergraduate school, it was a requirement in the university that I went to that I had to take lesson or classes in the appreciation of the arts, appreciation of music, uh, appreciation of literature. At that time, uh, I was uh, uh, greatly resistant to these classes because I was a science major in chemistry and biology. Now, in the years since, and the travels that I've done throughout the world, one of the great advantages that I find is the requirement to study the liberal arts and the sciences. And uh, it might be interesting to some of you listening. You know, I, I belong to the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and our ritual is unique in the Masonic world. We have no middle chamber lecture. We have no staircase lecture. We have no letter G lecture. Uh, our uh, uh, ritual is, uh, according to Neville Cryer, the noted uh, scholar from uh, England, we have the only survive using the only surviving literature of the modern Grand Lodge of the 1700s. And uh, the master does almost all of the uh, speaking in the conferral of all three of the degrees. If any of you ever have the chance and would like to see the uh, uh, Pennsylvania ritual, I would recommend it to you. It's unique, it's different, but unfortunately it does lack in some of the lectures it is available in most of North American Freemasonry. I would suspect that uh, Kentucky uses what is known as a web ritual 
most of the Grand Lodges in North America do. But I, if you want to see a different ritual, experience a different ritual, and learn from something different, I would encourage you to sometime travel to Pennsylvania to see our ritual. Again, I thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the uh, opportunity to just be able to sit and listen. I certainly congratulate all the presenters tonight. The program was excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Worship Brother Jackson. Um, uh, the pleasure is ours, and and we appreciate everyone and appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Um, Brothers, the hour is getting late, and I'd like to offer the floor to anyone within Rubicon Masonic Society or any attendees uh, and any, any of our presenters that uh, maybe something else was sparked in their mind that they wanted to add about this particular degree, degree before we move on. Brother Brian, if, if, if I may. Please. There is a question in the chat box that, uh, that we should address before, uh, before we leave. Uh, one of our brothers had a question about the use of the term guide. Go ahead. Perhaps brother, you or Brother Tim would like to elaborate on that. Well, I, I saw the question. I, I responded. I, it looks like I responded privately. Um, yeah, Tim, I'll, uh, did you see the question? The term guide is not, is, is not used in their state. So he was asking to clarify what the term guide meant. Is that the senior deacon? Uh, no, the well, I mean, the guide would be more of a uh, the person who well, no, wouldn't be the senior deacon because they're doing all the work. Um, it's the person who walks the candidate in the EA around or in the fellow craft, the uh, new brother. And typically, the stewards. Yes, who carry the staffs. Correct. So depending on how many men are going through the ritual, our brothers, um, having a guide, the stewards, to assist the senior deacon to escort uh, as, as may be needed within the lodge for different parts of the ritual. Brother Brian, um, in California ritual, uh, the senior deacon uh, conducts the candidates through each of them. And um, at a particular point at the beginning of the ritual, um, the candidate is instructed to uh, follow your guide and fear not what man can do unto you. And he is referring explicitly to the senior deacon. Thank you. Looks like another term, it would be conductor within degree work. Brian. Uh, I had one point to that. Please. Um, just to clarify too, so, our stewards and our senior deacon do do the ritual part of the conducting, but the guide in our lodge to, we try to involve some of our, so if, for example, if we have a fellow craft who were doing the fellow craft degree that night, we allow them to guide another candidate. Um, a lot of the times, and I've seen this actually done differently in Kentucky, where they'll, <clears throat> you, you might have the candidates guide themselves as a hand on a shoulder. Um, in our lodge, we have a guide for each individual candidate to actually help guide them around the lodge. So it's a little bit different to try and give a better experience and allow some of the fellow crafts to be a part of the ritual that night as well. So a little bit different, um, set up, but just wanted to kind of make that clarification. Thank you, brother. In Pennsylvania ritual, Brian, there is one man designated as a guide for each candidate and is responsible for escorting the candidate around the uh, floor and is called the guide. Thank you, Brother Jackson. Excellent. Uh, any other thoughts or discussions to be brought up regarding this degree of any kind? Brother Johnston, is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, it's not specific to this degree, but we had talked about meeting on the level earlier in our discussion. 
and I guess uh, kind of an anecdote. Um, uh, President Harry Truman uh, was a Mason, and my understanding is that he attended Lodge uh, while he was president, a sitting president. And uh, once he crossed the threshold of the Lodge, he was addressed as Brother Truman or Brother Harry, um, and not as Mr. President. And so I think if a, if a president can meet on the level, you know, I think any of us certainly can. But I thought that was interesting that, you know, um, he would be addressed that way. Of course, it's understandable we meet on the level, but um, he would be known as Brother Harry inside the lodge room. Great point. Thank you, brother. Excellent. Um, all right, we are going to proceed to close unless there are any other final comments. Worship Brother Kimball, do you have any other final comments before we proceed? Congratulate tonight's presenters. Uh, this was, uh, uh, it's an excellent topic and, uh, and our presenters did it justice. Uh, job well done. Indeed, thank you. Worship Brother Bizak, do you have any other final comments? Only to echo Brother Dan, excellent job, brothers. Indeed. At this time, I would like to call on uh, Worship Brother Lyle Van Adder, Chaplain of the Rubicon Masonic Society, to please deliver the closing devotion for our attendees this evening. Brothers, let us, brothers and friends, let us pray. Uh, great architect of the universe, we offer thanks for the opportunity to meet in the face of our adversities. Be with, nurture, and have mercy on all those who are sick and distressed in their lives. May all our efforts bring your peace and beauty, that we may manifest the primal will to good, which eternally creates and sustains the universe. Amen. So long. Thank you, worship brother. Brothers and friends, our next meeting is uh, two weeks from now on November 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will be diving into the Master Mason degree. Uh, if you are already on our RSVP list, you don't need to RSVP again. We will send the link to you uh, since you've already RSVP'd. If you know somebody that might be interested in attending or participating in this series, please encourage them and invite them to RSVP as well at rubiconmasonicsociety.com forward slash RSVP. Brothers and friends, I want to thank you for participating and uh, attending this, this evening and throughout the series. Uh, uh, we are grateful on behalf of Rubicon Masonic Society for your support, your commitment to your brothers, your commitment to your lodges, your commitment to Freemasonry, and most importantly, your commitment to God. So with that being said, I want to again thank you. Um, and you guys have a great evening. I look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. God bless.